Hi everyone, so my name is Pascal Daigle, I'm uh, from the Quartier des Spectacles Partnership. Uh, so I'm the director of programming of Quartier des Spectacles Partnership. Uh, for, uh, who, for people who don't know what is Quartier des Spectacles, it's a cultural district uh, located in uh, downtown uh, Montreal. So we cover, um, we cover one, kilometer, one kilometer cube. So, um, um, at um, at uh, Quartier des Spectacles Partnership, our job is to manage uh, uh, public spaces. So we manage eight public spaces and also video projection uh, facades. So you understand that I'm happy uh, to have this um, this panel today because uh, this qu the the question of the future of uh, uh, digital imagery is uh, is our um, is in uh, our ongoing uh, thought process now. So thanks to the Mutech team uh, to uh, for make it happen. So, uh, like I said, the Quartier des Spectacles um, manage a large network of uh, facade of video projection facade. We have six, and uh, it's dedicated exclusively to uh, artistic content. So, no, not commercial. So uh, we present different kind of um, of, uh, of work of artwork, work from uh, local or uh, work from uh, international artists. Uh, for example, uh, we recent, recently commissioned um, a work from uh, Studio Gentium, uh, Studio Gent uh, called uh, Lointain, Les Lointaines. Uh, Thibault is in uh, who is running uh, the the studio is in is it is with us today. Thibault will talk about Little Wainten. And also, currently, uh, we are presenting a really funny uh, work called uh, Space Monkey. Uh, Space Monkey is a work from uh, the, stu the um, Down of Man Collective, and Max is with us today. So, um, so as, uh, as you can see in the slide, will be present. Uh, this facade have, uh, has a, a, a great showcase for artists and for a um, new form of art. So um, this facade come also with challenges. So drawing uh, crowds outside for of specific events is uh, a big challenge. So like I said, we project different kind of work, some with or without sound, uh, interactive or a narrative. Um, we invite artists with various background and also what we want, our wish is to, uh, is that Cartier des Spectacles becomes a, a playground for a creator. So and, uh, on this spirit, uh, uh, with uh, Mutech and uh, Map Montreal, we organize a competition of uh, interactive mapping. We already select six semi-finalists. Uh, yesterday we test uh, their uh, prototype, yesterday night. So um, after this panel, uh, they will, uh, the semi-finalists uh, will present their uh, proposal. Um, so you can understand that we are very interesting in this panel today. So to run the panel, we have um, uh, Tanya Taff. She will present her work and uh, moderate the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. And thank you all for coming. Um, thank you to Mutic for inviting me um, to, uh, to take on this uh, interesting and uh, delicate task of speaking about digital imagery in the public space. Um, so at the moment, we are exceeding our wildest imaginations when it comes to the opportunities we have for creating aesthetic experiences with digital imagery in the public space. We can expand urban space, as Pascal just showed examples of, with creative, playful, enlightening, and contemplative imagery that is powerful enough to temporarily capture people's awareness. And it takes a lot today to capture people's awareness. 
we can offer experience of deeply intensified presence, of reconfigured social encounters, or of translocal hybrid connectivity, while bringing attention to issues of artistic and creative inquiry. Our opportunity seems to be pretty unlimited. So at a quick glance at our current frontier of digital imagery in the urban space, we see an exponential increase in scale and intensity. We see high technological performance, and we see an increasing sophistication of operative behaviors of imagery that sync with the data of our environments, our actions, and our emotions. The question is, if our current digital imagery, especially exploited by corporate and political powers, are taking us to culturally and sustainable futures that, in which we want to live. So, when we open up for thinking about not only the current frontier of di digital imagery in the urban space, but also the next frontier, then we are free, and we should also feel responsible, I would say, to ask, what do we actually want from digital imagery in public space? Especially, we should ask that question today, because we are fortunate to work on this, on the creative side of things, um, where we might be able to introduce different imperatives than uh, perhaps purely corporate or uh, political ones. So I suggest that with this panel, and in this highly advanced technological context of the MUTIC Festival in Montreal, um, which probably brings together some of the best creators in the world, we not only consider the next frontier in terms of technological excellence, but that we take the opportunity to think more critically about what the next frontier actually means as a desirable path. These are questions that I deal with in my research and curatorial practice, which I have also been uh, asked to introduce uh, as part of the introduction here. So, like some of the panelists today, I'm involved with creation uh, through curatorial commission. So I'm not a creator myself, I'm not an artist, I don't program, but I facilitate and create context for art. I also write about it. And I'm associated with the Streaming Museum in New York City, directed by Nina Colosi, which curates exhibitions of digital art in urban public space in globally networked projects. Since 2012, I've also been involved with the SP Urban Digital Festival, uh, together with Marilia Pasculi, that presents video-based and interactive media art in the public spaces of Sao Paulo, with particular concern for the socio-political conditions of public space in that city. And most intensely at the moment, uh, and most intensely last year, I curate the Screen City Biennial in Stavanger in Norway, together with Daniela Ariado, which is dedicated to presenting the expanded moving image in the urban domain of public space. And I will just show you a um, video that sums up how the biennial took place in October last year. So you are now in um, Stavanger in Norway, an oil capital of Norway, which is in a process of refinding its, uh, its existence after the oil crisis uh, following the financial crisis. Working with the Screen City Biennial, I am mainly responsible um, as one half of our curatorial team uh, of our artistic research program, which makes a backbone for our productions. Um, and this involves researching the deeper implications between media art and public space and the issues, the urgent issues that are facing not only Stavanger, but also Stavanger's uh, place in a global context, a network context. 
and especially in Stavanger, um, this ties into how the city is part of um, a flagship project, a smart city flagship project, where a lot of smart city initiatives and uh, innovations will be implemented in the years to come. And through our research, we are taking a proactive um, a position of collaboration with the, the city governance and urban planning uh, offices in Stavanger to try to be part of the dialogue with the art, facilitating art of how our cities should evolve the technologies towards the future. And this is not something that we have found uh, the methodology for yet, but we are in the process of uh, opening up for that dialogue since we work with media art in a public space. It seems like it's a, it would be a next step of somehow taking responsibility. However, uh, moving on, we are working um, around questions that concern the role of art and artistic inquiry in this, um, in this process of, uh, of Stavanger. Last year, I initiated the Urban Media Art Academy together with Sousa Pop, uh, which is a globally networked educational program that investigates urban media art as a domain of a sustainable practice with media aesthetics in urban space. And our programs mainly take place via field trips. So we started out in Bangkok last year and this year in Sao Paulo. And later this year we go to Durban, South Africa, and we go to Beijing. Um, and uh, my, so I can return to the Academy's practices later, but my work with digital imagery in the urban space is driven by questions that concern the deeper implications of art, both to us and our environment. And let us just consider the context of the practices that we do. We live in an omnipresent digital culture surrounded by ubiquitous visuals at architectural, handheld and sensible scales. The domination of the sense of sight in Western culture since the Renaissance and the beginning of the scientific revolution has shaped our ocular-centric paradigm up through the modern era and left us in a current situation of almost unlimited abilities to fully immerse ourselves in artificial imagery. The omnipresence of digital imagery today is however critical beyond a concern with corporate or politically manipulative forces that are causing human dullness, alienation, or situations of manipulation as has otherwise been at the center of our concern, heavily informed by critical theory. As Liam Young so mindfully stressed in his keynote yesterday, our new technologies are implicated with much deeper uh, and more concerning questions relating to our human well-being and the world's ecosystems. And when we speak about the urban domain, just think, for example, of how the intensification of, um, of modular screens and like augmentations of buildings disrupt patterns of bird migration and how this will eventually affect our ecosystem. On a quick philosoph philosophical note, I would like to briefly evoke the French philosopher Henri Bergson's concept of the image, which he conceives at a much more fine-grained and molecular scale than how we traditionally think of the image as somehow a delimited field area in terms of a painting in a frame. So Bergson considers the image much closer to a, a sensible concept in between an impression and a thing. And the image is bound to our dynamic memory processes and hence to our intuitive habits of coping with our environment. So in this sense, if we break down the image not to its pixels, but to sense impressions of intensity and intelligence, we have to consider how images interfere with the functioning of living organisms. So what this means for us humans, besides the biological effects of how low frequencies of light, blue and ultraviolet light, damages our eyes, disturbs our biological clocks, and prevents the production of melatonin, which researchers have linked to causing higher rates of certain forms of cancer, this concerns how digital imagery distributes sensibilities that cannot be measured, but that still affect our body system. So in our current technological culture, these sensibilities expose us to temporalities of machinic processes that are driven by algorithmic processes and not fitting with the temporalities of our human consciousness. So basically our experience with technology is much faster than what our human system can actually cope with. 
And these machinic temporalities come to affect our ways of perceiving, feeling and understanding, eventually leaving us not only distracted, but also impulsive, practicing emotes of unreflected sameness and in states of indifference. Indifference to each other, to what our actions cause, to how we shape our surrounding environments and to the evolution of our planet. So basically, when we consider the next frontier in digital imagery in the urban space, we need to connect this to reflections on where we are heading and how digital imagery in the urban space um, participates in shaping our human technogenesis, meaning our evolution with technology, how it participates in urban formation and environmental change. So how is creative digital imagery in the urban space not only demonstrating the next frontier in terms of technological and conceptual excellence, but with this pushing our excellence to further more sociocultural and environmental sustainable conditions in the urban space? How does the next frontier of digital imagery contribute not only to regeneration in the local, concrete, urban context, but also play a role in our global human and cultural coping with digital culture? And this is not least in perspective of our increasingly intelligent, smartified urban environments that are just around the corner and perhaps already here. So all of this translates into what digital imagery offers to its audiences both in the moment and long term, both culturally and environmentally. And when we consider creative practices, which should have our human betterment in mind, if, any, if anything should, this is my hope, then which social tactics, which materialities, behaviors, and modes of integration in the urban domain can we then further in order to move technological innovation and our digital culture, cultural path in more sustainable directions. So in other words, what do we want from digital imagery in the urban space? This question I would like to ask our panelists in a little bit following their individual introductions. And I am very honored uh, to soon be in conversation with the Thibaut Duvanet, Jean-Francois Larouche, Max Nova and Martin Pasta, um, where we will try to address some of these concerns of uh, uh, human sustainable future measures in perspective of our concrete practices. So we'll try to drag it back there. So first, I would like to introduce uh, for each of the panelists for five minutes introductions to their practice and then after that we will have a conversation and in the end of course open up uh, for questions from you. So first uh, Thibaut Duvenet, if you will uh, sit up. Uh, Thibaut has a background in fine art and uh, digital technologies in design art practice from Concordia, uh, also from France. Uh, he creates cross-disciplinary projects out of his studio, Chantillon, and his, he has directed and supervised various film shows, shows and interactive installations. And then I will leave you to introduce the rest. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks to everyone uh, for being here. It's a, it's a very nice panel and I'm super excited. Um, so yeah. My work is not necessarily just doing projection mapping. Uh, I have a weird background. I come from computer science. Uh, then I went into fine art. Uh, and I also studied in cinema. So basically, you know, I'm more interested in creating work that's going to connect with people. Uh, I do film. I do interactive installation. I don't care much about the media as long as I can connect uh, with the audience. And uh, the most important thing for me is to uh, forget about the technology, uh, to just make people wonder, um, not how it's done, but like just create this kind of magical moment with people. Uh, and I also try to really have a commitment to think that the audience is smarter than most of the people think the audience is. Um, and I think the audience now is really craving interactivity and, um, and you know, engaging content um, and not just advertising. Um, so like I was saying, my, my practice is truly cross-disciplinary, multi-platform, um, and 
I create work that's kind of funny, grotesque, and also sensual. Uh, and then I started my own studio that's called Gentilhomme, uh, which is a Montreal-based uh, studio that we started in 2013. Uh, we bring together creative coders, designers, uh, musicians, uh, people who do ceramic, uh, serigraphy, uh, um, people from all of kind of disciplines, um, and we create turnkey solutions uh, for interactive installation, cinema, and uh, like I was saying, just engaging with the audience. I think we are the crossword of video game, um, contemporary art, engineering, and cinema. I think that's kind of the best description that I can do about uh, what we do. Uh, I wanted to present just two projects. Um, we have a bunch of projects that you can see on our website and demo, but I think um, I just wanted to talk about these two for today because I, I feel like they are relevant to the topic. Um, this project is called uh, Locomotive, which is really a um, uh, a project that's really important for me um, because in the way that it engage uh, with the audience and also uh, because of the process because it's a, it's a project that we did for Place des Arts uh, and then we delivered that project and then uh, the client had cold feet and didn't want to show it and said what well, that's monstrous and I said yes thank you that's monstrous I love it like, that's exactly what <laughs> what I want. Uh, so then we filmed it, they didn't want to release it, so we put on Vimeo, we got a Vimeo staff pick, uh, and they were actually worried that people would show to the public space and would be offended, um, so they didn't want to play it. But then, like thousands of people, like hundreds of thousands of people saw it on the internet, and they were actually calling Place des Arts to know when it was playing and where they could see it. <laughs> so for me, that's a really good project because it went out. It had to go out because the audience wanted to see it even if it wasn't there because it was kind of censored. So that's the project. So that's it. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, that's kind of the storyboard and that's what we delivered. So I like also to plan things very well in advance. So, you know, what we do is exactly what we said it was gonna be. Uh, that's another project that we did in collaboration uh, with Cartier des Spectacles. Um, they, uh, they offered us the opportunity to, uh, uh, to create a piece during the winter to try to bring color to the city. Uh, so we wanted to do something very poetic about space travel and um, and colors during the winter. So in terms of my point on you know, digital imagery in public space, to me it's not necessarily just about um, digital imagery, it's, it's how you connect with people and how um, you, you can really 
make them participate um, in the public space uh, big, and things are changing because it just used to be advertising but now people they just really understand that they can have meaningful content and they are craving meaningful content so it's pushing you know cities to create platforms to curate artists uh, and celebrate their architectural platforms and it's also pushing brands to develop content that is actually meaningful and that's going to connect with people so for me that's that's really the point it's not about just projection mapping or interactivity it's just create content that people want to want to consume and experience so my time is limited, so I'm going to cut the video. You can see the full video online, or you can just go to Cartier des Spectacles website. Um, and I was asked to uh, bring a couple of references. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to show one from our friend Deli Toulejo, which is not digital imagery at all, but that's, that's a really good example to how to connect with people in the urban space. So basically, you create shadows, uh, music with your shadow. And that's really effective. So that's it. Thank you. Hello. I guess I'm the next one. Ah, okay. You can do it here if you want. All right, thank you. So, um, Jean-Francois Larouche is now taking the stage and he is uh, a director of the interactive team at Moment Factory. He came to this from a career in user interface design uh, and the user experience, I believe, is uh, pretty much at the heart of your projects. Okay. I look forward to hear more about them. Thank you. Thank you. Definitely. And I'm also a techno geek and I really, really love design especially interactive design. And for the last 15 years, I've been working in this industry, uh, doing UX, UI, understand how the user interact with computers. And uh, I really like the next, the last three years I've been spending at Moment Factory because I had to explode the interface on, in the real world and try and start working with having interfaces on the walls and real tangible objects. And yes, there are blueberries at the beginning, for those who understand what it means. Yes, I'm from there. Uh, so yes, uh, exploding the interface. So I like to say that because uh, as I'm from, like my canvas used to be a computer screen or a phone screen. And the mission is very important. At Moment Factory, the mission, the motto, or motto for those who don't know, is we do it in public. And it's kind of uh, funny, of course. And uh, we like to say that, uh, you know, in a world that technology helps us connect in different ways, we use Facebook, SMS all the time, but when you're with your friends, with your family in public space, uh, technology can separate us. So we like to bring people together to connect and engage in new ways. And in new ways is very important because innovation is very important. It's key of what we do. We'll spend a lot of time doing research and development. Maybe I'll have time to talk about it later. So for real, so in the real world. So, and I like the slides because uh, you understand that I like interactive design. So interaction creates more engagement and brands and, and everyone today wants people to have to gain their attention because there are so many things happening around. And at Moment Factory, we want people to leave our project and have good memories. So uh, more engagement create good memories, more memories. Um, so we do shows, we, so we do a permanent project, like more and more permanent project like Destinations. And it brings me to this question of what is the future of digital imagery in public spaces? And I would like to try to sum it, sum it in um, what we think in one slide. So for me, I divide it into parts. The first category would be what is the future of technology? What technology is bringing us would bring us in the future. So of course, the new sensors, the new way of tracking people in the space. You know, the Kinect from Microsoft have, has been stopped in production. So I'm kind of happy because it's going to push everyone to try to find something else to capture the body movement of people in space. Uh, you have new projector every year that comes out uh, with more resolution that creates more immersion, uh, more richness in the visuals. And also, I like this one is real time visuals. You know. Uh, uh, interactivity, we can create um, 
The game engine like Unity or Unreal are getting more and more used for public space visuals and could create real-time visuals that are very high-end. Uh, before, to do real-time, it was very the quality was not that good. But today, with good with the, all the new graphic cards that come out, it's it, we're able to to achieve a quality that is very nice. Uh, I can talk. I need to talk about artificial intelligence because you know we talk about it all the time. It's going to revolutionize, going to change the way uh, all the industries that uh, we know, and also, of course, entertainment will be affected by that. Soon, we're going to be able to know uh, the the machine will tell us where are the people, what they do, what they, what's the context. So we're going to be able to adapt and and create more surprises because the the goal of all this is create more engagement. And so I like surprises. I like to be surprised when I'm in a public space. And augmented reality, of course, this is something that it looks very intangible now because it's it's hysterical. We don't see a lot of it today, but. Um, AR will be the next, uh, you know, is the next computing platform, and it will likely replace the the, the smartphone that w the smartphone that we all have in our pocket today. Uh, a lot of people say that in 10 years it's going to be replaced by glasses, so we're going to be able to to add layers of virtual over the real world. So it's going to be very interesting to see how everything will will evolve, and of course the next category will be. The future of user experiments. How, what will we do with all this new tech uh, interactivity? Of course, because it's what I like, and I want to push it. And I think it's about we had a discussion. And I think with the future, we think that people want to be involved into uh, what they do. Uh, so of course, the the, the 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 word that we all we all use: uh, playful, gameful, gamification, and also live action game. I'll show you an example of a workshop we did at Moment Factory a couple of weeks ago uh, on live action games. So just to quickly, to quickly show you a couple of examples, this is Grid. This is a public space game that we did at Moment Factory. Uh, oh, is it going to start? So uh, this is, uh, yeah, uh, it's like the, the new version of Pong, but a collective way of playing with your friends in a public space. And right now it's in our studio, but this was uh, published online lately and it, had, it got a, a lot of attraction. So it's very fun. And you can look at the old video online if you want to. Uh, and if you want to test it, when you have, uh, we have the open uh, the Porte Ouverte at Moment Factory, you can come and play with it. Uh, U Arena in Paris, we have a partnership with this, we're, we're producing content for, for this big arena in Paris right now, uh, for a couple of months now, and we just, we took this idea of grid and tried to apply it uh, in on a, a stadium, because uh, in the stadium, what is very particular is we have 45, I think it's 45, am I wrong, uh, projector all around with mirror, so we're able to, we're able to move the, the visuals on the on the ground so this is very nice to see people running around and it's it gives you an idea of what we can do uh, on public in public spaces with that uh, live action games this is a workshop we did at moment factory i'll just show you a couple of, of images uh, it was a big uh, you, you had a role during the night you have four teams and we have to play a game it was kind of men in black thematic thing and at the end we had this big game on the floor where people the teams had to play together so you understand that uh, we like interactivity we like making people having fun with each other and playing so this is something that you can look we will see online soon we're going to publish it this next week i think for those who haven't who are visiting montreal uh, go see aura at the basilic this is uh, not interactive but it is is very interesting because it's an immersive uh, in a basilic, in a basilica, it's an immersive uh, projection over there. And of course, I wanted to talk about. I had to do give a, to, to talk about the project that we really like. You know, our friends from Lou Playground. Uh, I don't know what's the name. Play Lou Play Lou. Anyways, uh, they do an amazing thing for uh, to to make kids play in uh, in school using technology, using projection, interactivity. So this is very inspiring, and we. we we hope this project will be, be very good for them soon. Uh, and I want to end this with the new real uh, interactive reel. It will show you uh, at the end the bridge, the Jacques Cartier bridge, which is not interactive but it's generative. We took uh, it's in the public space. 
We took the data from Montreal, from the, the, the bike, from uh, the, the traffic and everything and the weather and we tried every night to create a, a art piece that is living. So I will end on this. Moment factory is ready. Ready to connect you with the environment. With each other. In new ways. By exploding the interface. Touch. for your next activation. Cell. Body. This cell. Cell. This cell. But it will be so soon on Facebook, so check it out. Thank you. Thank you, François. Tiens, François, sorry. And now um, we will have uh, Max Nova presenting briefly, uh, who is co-founder of Dawn of Man, which creates digital experiences for the dawn of a digital world. I am curious to also to hear what that means, because that's a line I took directly from your bio. Uh, I think it sounds beautiful. So uh, Max, I also want to mention, uh, also teaches a course at the New York University, Live Video Performance Art. So here's a both a uh, creator and a scholarly background. Please, Max. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's my first time in Montreal. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, so yes. Uh, I want to tell you about the president of my company, or my collective. His name is Space Monkey. <clears throat> He's a monkey, actually, who uh, traveled to outer space and only lands in the most special places around the world uh, for special occasions, such as this one. Um, originally, this project was actually a gorilla projection installation, which we were projecting around New York City. Um, gorilla sort of a double uh, meaning here, but uh, really what I mean by that is we are doing this without permission, so it's a form of street art, if you will. Um, we would drive up to a location with a vehicle, uh, with a projector mounted to the vehicle, and using a generator project the images of Space Monkey dancing um, on various buildings. So. Uh, the Space Monkey project kind of took off. We were actually contacted by the New York Times, who then wrote an article about this character. And since then, we've been invited to project Space Monkey at various places, such as uh, the Electricity Festival in Detroit, North by Northeast Festival in Toronto, and Adelaide Festival in uh, Australia. So Space Monkey has traveled the world, indeed, and in addition to the galaxy. And you can uh, actually have an opportunity to see Space Monkey and his friend Banana Man dancing on the various facades around town, as you heard before. Um, so uh, another project I want to tell you guys about that Dawn of Man was involved in creating is a uh, project that, let me uh, just let the title come up and so it can really s sink in. So, projection napping. Um, this is a, a great opportunity to have like an audience that actually understands this joke. It's a pretty select demographic of people who understand that. Um, but yes, uh, projection napping, uh, it sort of began as a kind of um, random ideas. Uh, well, you've heard of projection mapping, but what about projection napping? Oh. So that was kind of how it, it, it originated, um, just sort of as a random idea. And then we became more and more obsessed with this concept of l large sleeping bodies being projected around the city. And um, this, was a, this is a compilation of about 20 different nappers, um, all projected around New York City. Each of them are site specific, so we would take uh, measurements of the building surfaces, photographs, decide which angles we wanted to film from, and then create the uh, content with friends of ours uh, at our studio in Brooklyn. Um, 
where we would film the nappers uh, and then have sort of settings for them to align to different walls and corners, have limbs draping off of ledges, and various ways that would um, bring the concept of this story into the world of projection mapping using the contours of those surfaces as direct positions for those nappers to rest on. Um, so this was um, initially a collection of, of nappers projected in New York, as you can see. Um, the nappers were then, uh, we expanded this project and actually projected nappers around Berlin. Um, here are a few still images of the Berlin nappers. And as with Space Monkey, projection napping also, um, we were surprised to see the way that people reacted to these nappers. Um, it was, like I said, sort of a random idea to start out with, something that we thought was just a nice thing to look at. We never really had a specific um, manifesto or uh, philosophy behind it, but it was very interesting to see how people would interpret it and, and brought out philosophies. We were actually contacted by, um, uh, for example, the Narcolepsy Society who, said, who contacted us with praise and thanks to say, wow, thank you so much for putting this important piece together that celebrates sleep as an important and beautiful thing, especially in this, in this day and age in, in urban settings in cities where sleep is not uh, something that you have as much access to because you're so busy in your uh, professional lifestyle that you would uh, not have time to sleep and it's, it's looked down upon to sleep. You should be working harder, you should be staying up. Well, they saw this piece and for them it was uh, an expression of the importance of sleep, which was never, never necessarily our intention, but I think was really wonderful to hear that reaction. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I think that same um, uh, concept can also be applied to Space Monkey in that um, the, the reactions that we will uh, see people having are always surprising, always different. Um, my favorite reaction to Space Monkey is just spontaneous dance. If anyone is gonna see Space Monkey and dance immediately, those are our people. That's the, those are the Space Monkey's people. They understand it. But even more interestingly is when someone doesn't understand it and is troubled by it or questions it, asks me, well, what is this advertising? Or uh, why are you doing this? Um, and so those are the fun, fun conversations that we get to have about Space Monkey and uh, more about that in the discussions that will follow. Um, so thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Max. So uh, next is Martin Pasta. Um, Martin Pasta graduated from uh, VSC and FAMO universities and uh, worked with the Kalovivari International Film Festival before founding the film production company Fresh Film. Um, and also before founding the design show Supermarket and the Signal Light Festival in the Czech Republic, which I imagine you would show us some examples from. So uh, thank you, Martin. Thank you, thank you very much for having me. You took everything I actually wanted to say, so there's nothing much I can say anymore. No, but uh, my background, yeah, this is me, if you couldn't tell, this is me. So uh, thank Mutech for having me. This I always love to come, not it's my first time actually here in Montreal, but I love to come to uh, events that kind of like may, make my mind boggled, troubled, and I keep thinking about things that I, I have heard and, and it kind of resonates in my, in my mind, so thanks for having me. As, as mentioned, I just briefly, my background is in film. So I uh, founded and directed the film festival for 11 years. It was focused mostly on promoting uh, young filmmakers to you know, help them emerge actually from after they left the film schools. Afterwards, we founded a design event, which was, the focus was the same actually, to help young designers to kind of, uh, you know, get there up front uh, from their school desks and actually be more visible in front of the general public. And then I took a, a detour and I produced a hip hop documentary, if you can tell, I'm a real, you know, hip hopper. So at, uh, 
as it usually is at one of the events that we organize, a design event, I met uh, friends of mine uh, at the bar and they asked me they need a help uh, producing a project, uh, which was quite uncommon at that time, I mean, especially in Prague, uh, to produce a, a projection mapping on the Prague clock tower. And it was the first narrative, I mean, first our first narrative projection mapping that we've created, and it was depicting about the history, depicting the history of the clock tower. Uh, the 600 years, it was, uh, a lot, I mean, it was a narrative video mapping at that time, it was still popular. It's less and less popular now. And uh, one project that I, I thought I'm going to present, but then I decided not to present it in video because of a sh lack of time, is uh, our kind of recent project. We've created uh, video map indoor video mapping projection with the Live Philharmonic Orchestra, a uh, 45-minute show in the, in the indoor um, like this beautiful uh, indoor venue in Prague. Um, and uh, well, after the clock tower video mapping, uh, we I figured out that I, I'm never going to be able to see in person the, the things that I love, that, that uh, I mean, the artists that I love, if I had to travel and see them. So, so we've decided to make something which at that time seemed to be more easy and it didn't turn out to be easier to start a light festival, I mean, or tech art festival in Prague. So that's how Signal came to life about five years ago. Now it's going to be six years. Uh, it became quite fast and surprisingly for us, to be really honest, to become the largest cultural event, I mean, most attended cultural event in, in the Czech Republic, probably in the region. It's, it's four nights, so it's like a Fête de Lumi uh, sorry, um, a Nuit Blanche, but extended to four nights. Um, it's in, the fifth, in its fifth edition, and, and basically we try to integrate, as mentioned, like art, technology, and public space all together, blend in. And, and we started with, you know, with the artists that we really loved and wanted to see, so anti-VJ, 1024 architecture, and, and guys like that, that we try every year to invite new and new and new, and, and that's why you know, events like Resonate or, or Mutech is really important for me to see where the stuff is evolving and trying to persuade people who are not really probably commonly working in public space to introduce their art or to introduce their thought processes in the public space. Um, and I'm just going to show you a short video. It's kind of a mood, what the festival is like. Sorry, I have to skip the video because I'm running out of time. So uh, we, we became, as I mentioned, we have about 600,000 people over the course of four nights. So it's getting crammed in the city of Prague. Uh, um, well, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that's what I want to say. Uh, we have people coming from all over the Czech Republic. So this is kind of art of analytics. It, it's kind of, uh, yeah, in the time of Facebook, it's kind of spooky, but we don't retain all, none of the data, etc., etc. We also think that education is really important. So we, we started an ed educational platform called Transmit. This is David Coeola presenting. And we also, I mean, we work nationally and internationally, not just as a studio, but as, as, a, as a festival itself. We help start about 
four festivals just kind of out of pure, I guess, joy of creating something new. So we started a festival in, two festivals in the Czech Republic and another tech art festival in, in Romania. I'm going to skip that slide. And thank you very much. And this is my contacts in case you need it. And thanks for having me. Thanks. Thank you, Martin. All right. You, uh, at least I can speak for myself, I, but I think you make us, made us all wish that we had been there during the festival. It was a beautiful video. Oh yeah, I, I, I forgot to invite you. It's in mid-October this year, so you're more than welcome. It's a bit far off and it's freezing us here, so all Canadians all are enjoy. welcome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, so thank you all. Uh, for presenting your incredible projects. I am completely uh, completely humbled uh, towards what you what you can create. This is how uh, curators and theorists often think when they are not also artists and creators. Like, oh, how do, how do they do that? I mean, it's really it's really impressive work that you have uh, presented um, to us here. And uh, I think that if I am just to uh, start out the conversation, how much time do we have for the conversation before we should move on to the 40? 30, 30 minutes? Yes, yes. So um, first, just the rules of the game. If anybody has a question along the way, please just wave uh, and interrupt so that we can uh, open up as soon as possible. Um, but if I'm just to um, connect to my introduction, perhaps, which I, um, I don't mean, I did not mean to be too dystopic at the same time as a lot of what is happening with digital imagery in the urban space is a bit uh, dystopic, perhaps, or at least it feels like a wild horse running uh, where we can do everything uh, and everybody can do everything everything, not only well-intended artists and creators, uh, but we have a very uh, near coming foreseeable future where we will be completely immersed. You spoke about augmented reality being our next, uh, our next iPhone, a mo uh, smartphone, exactly. So that is not something in 50 years, that is something that's coming very soon. So the scenario that I, the scenario I try to draw in the introduction to this panel, is actually a way of uh, confronting us with how digital imagery is implicated with change, change that can go in one direction or the other. So I would like to just open the panel with a question for each of you, uh, and I would like to, you to all reflect on this, how you think your practices are implicated with urban change? No matter what, if it's uh, directly with the audience, uh, with a city that is changing, the level you decide. But how do you think your work relates to urban change? Who wants to start? So I, I think that um, one of the interesting things about digital imagery in the urban space uh, is that we're seeing it pop up more and more around the cities. Uh, people are becoming used to it, but more often than not, it is in the uh, context of advertisement. So you have uh, advertising billboards, LED walls. Uh, I'm from New York, so we have a lot of those, especially if you've ever been to Times Square, the whole place is basically a video screen. Um, and only recently have they used some of these screens for the purposes of artwork. Um, and so, uh, you know, in the case of when we're projecting, for example, Space Monkey, sometimes people immediately jump to the conclusion that it's advertisement because of the fact that that is what we see so prevalently in, in the, in the, you know, when we have digital imagery in the urban space, um, people become used to it being advertisements, so when they see something that isn't, they don't exactly know how to interact with that or how to understand it um, because it's a new kind of thing. Um, so I think that it's interesting uh, to be part of this because it, you know, we want to encourage people to interact with the, with the art in public space and not immediately react with so much uh, skepticism uh, and, and open up to experiences and having those moments um, in the public space um, more freely and less guarded. Um, I can't tell you how many times people will walk past uh, one of our projection art pieces just completely blinded from it. They don't, they don't even notice that it's happening because they're so desensitized to um, those kinds of imageries being used for advertisement. 
and why would you like people to be less blinded? I'm asking because usually, um, uh, or sometimes we are uh, we are concerned that we are too little blinded or too little skep skeptical. So well, I think it's it's good to. Um well, blindness is never a good thing, I guess. Um, if you're able to open your eyes and, and see the world around you um, in, instead of just being in your own head or being in your smartphone, um, this is going to be a healthy thing. Thanks. Next up. I just, I just want to say that I come from a bit different background. I mean, you know, Eastern Europe, communist stuff, etc. So, uh, but honestly, now I'm, I'm kind of joking partially about it, but uh, it, I, for me, it's a, a lot about social perceptions uh, because over the course of pa past, I don't know, 30 years, 40 years, people have been kind of isolated in their homes and, and, and everything has been, it has a lot of been about me, myself, my, my immediate environment and, and not really connecting with the, with the city, with the people, with friends. So, so my perspective is actually, and secondly, after after you know the the, the block, the the, the 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 wall came down, uh, Prague became flooded by tourists. So there's two aspects: Prague being the city of tourists, and the city center not actually being occupied by by uh, by uh, inhabitants of Prague, because you either work there or you don't go there. I mean, there there's no reason. So so f my my one of the points was actually like the social aspect, to bring the families, kids, friends, from sitting in front of their TVs, computers, tablets, whatever there is, and actually re rejoining in, in the city center together, and then reoccupying, like reoccupy the walls, reoccupy re the city center of Prague by, by, by their presence, at least for the four nights. To, and then, then, plus, kind of augmenting it by, by art. Right, not not just the architecture, and then, then this juxtaposition of of uh, this classical architecture that we have, and you have around here too, uh, with with the modern technology, and and kind of uh, try to link that as seamlessly as possible, if you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Uh, for me, where well, I share the same point of view as uh, as advertise on advertising, like you know, people are just expecting to see advertising, and 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 they are surprised. Um, but I think you know, once they are surprised, then they expect it, and then they're gonna crave it more. You know, and it's it's gonna follow the same evolution than TV, which is like, you know, like you get used to advertising because you don't care, you go pee where it's playing, you know, and and then you want your content, and then you know there is less and less advertising because the brands they have to create custom content to to engage with the audience, and then they realize that they actually have to spend money creating proper content to connect with them. Um, so so we definitely see that shift in commercial work, but then you have the other side of the spectrum, which is also weird, uh, which is like, if you go, let's say, to Dubai or something like this, and then you're gonna build a building, and then you, it's expected to have um, art form. That is not even art form, but it's like, you know, you have to have a show, you know, like you're building a tower, you want that show, and it has to be there, and it has to be bigger than the, the one before, and it has like <laughs> lasers everywhere, and, and, and uh, so then it's a big problematic, you know, it's like, yes, people are, are, are spending money on building these platforms, uh, but then they're gonna still create shitty content for it at some point, so you, you still have to have artists that's gonna hijack these things all the time, so whether you're hijacking advertising, um, you're also gonna have to hijack the, the shitty show that you find in Dubai, you know, like, so it's like, I think you st we're still gonna have to hijack everything all the time if we wanna create relevant work, uh, so, so yeah, let's, let's be hackers. <laughs> and for me, I would answer your question by our motto, we do it in public. We want people, like you said, to leave their phone, leave their computer and be with family and friends. And it's, we always talk about it at uh, the moment because uh, when we have to choose between what project do we do, is it related to that motto and that vision? So. Um, and I would uh, let's take about let's talk about the luminas the night uh, walk that we did. It's it's in the forest, but it could be in a city in the middle of the, of the city. We're discussing discussing maybe creating some in cities. Uh, it's very nice, I think. To it's possible to bring people outside and having spending time. It's crazy that we have to talk about it right now. But when you walk on the street and you look at everyone with their phones and they are so immersed into their own world, own bubble. So I think it's good to, uh, yeah, it's positive. I think I see the future positively, yes. All right. Yeah. So 
May I perhaps um, push you a little in terms of uh, when I look, for example, uh, at your projects at Moment Factory, which are so artistic elements and also corporate solutions, and you have this blurry line between the two. Uh, what do you think with the projects, perhaps uh, of what you showed here, but what is what is really in it for the audience? And of course we can say, it brings people together in public space, we create playful scenarios and, and we uh, take up spaces that might otherwise be scary. There, there are things that we can say, but what do you think, like from the heart, what's really in it for the audience in these experiences and perhaps what might the artistic elements offer or afford that uh, that gives something that plain corporate strategies couldn't provide? You know, when you have to answer and find solution for a client, it's called design. You have to design something. But what I like to say is that we add, at Moment Factory, we, we add art in our project. So we create emotion. We, we want to touch people. We want to be like... I'll take a, again the example of the Lumina when families walk into a forest and they live stuff together. So they have, uh, it's not only like, it's not ads, it's not uh, for selling a product, it's just selling a, a magical world and pe people having fun in that magical world with family and friends. So yeah, it's not all the projects that are like that, of course, but uh, yes, it's, it's part, I understand your, your question, but it's, yeah, it's... How is it not all just art. Soma? Was that? How is it not all just Soma? If we take a, a Huxley reference, Brave New World, where the main protagonists are completely doped by fantastic, uh, feeling good all the time, they eat this little pill, then they never feel pain. Um, I provoke you a little now, but what what I want to talk about is how these images are not only set out. Whether the intent comes from uh, art, design, advertisement, what it is. So it goes to all of you actually. How and myself. How is what we are doing not just providing people with a visual stimuli that somehow drugs us to feel good in our, in our super sleek, sufficient world with the mobile phone and everything? How is it not just that? How can we do more than that? I don't know who might like to pick up on that. Well, um, I think it's interesting, uh, you know, of course, we have the escapism of, of an enjoyable uh, gamified scenario. We, you know, it's an, even if it's off of the cell phone and not in the computer, um, we still are in a space of enjoyment. And it's uh, more, the purpose there is to just, like you were saying, to be kind of escaping, to feeling good. Um, but I think there's an additional, um, there's an additional goal uh, sometimes to this public uh, art work um, is to have people question their environment. Um, especially with, in the case of outdoor projection mapping, um, and specifically, uh, for example, let's go back to Space Monkey, who is um, originally projected as a, a non-sponsored, not non-curated uh, guerrilla projection piece. This is something that people aren't expecting to see. It's not something they signed up for. They didn't buy a ticket. So, um, you know, you might buy a ticket to go see a movie because you want to escape from your life. You want to have a, a moment to be in virtual reality. Um, but when you see something in, on your walk home from work projected on the wall that you didn't expect, it, it's now transplanted into your life. It's no longer something you've escaped from your life to see. It is actually part of your day. Um, and so in that way, it becomes uh, something that is not only hopefully inspiring, but also raises some questions. Uh, and that's why I said before, I really like it when people are very inquisitive or almost troubled by these, these actions uh, or these activations, because that's an interesting conversation. Why are you doing this? How are you doing this? Of course, you know, there is a cost to these things, and so it's not always um, accessible to everyone. But what I would hope is that people would kind of realize that you can do stuff you don't have to necessarily wait for an invitation or you don't have to necessarily wait for a platform to speak your voice and to uh, project, quite literally, um, your ideas. So, um, you know, again, there's always the, the technological, um, you know, equipment and budget that is a, an obstacle, of course. Um, and uh, I think that that's something we can work towards, hopefully becoming more accessible uh, to everyone. But uh, 
yeah, I think that it's what's really a, the most successful possible outcome to someone seeing a public artwork is that they come away with it with a lot of questions, not only about the project, but about their own existence and, at their, and their own uh, interaction with the public and with the environment around them. Well, for me personally, it's kind of a layer, layer cake. It has mo more levels, as Mac, Mac, Max mentioned. You can go to the theater and just switch your brain off and get entertained, or not to. So it's basically the content that you present. And, and um, as Thibault mentioned, I mean, I think we have achieved uh, uh, something that is kind of hij hijacking the attention of 600,000 people now. And we can, I mean, in a positive way, definitely, we, we have to be careful in curating the pieces that actually are, well, we have to balance between entertainment and, and let's say, more uh, deeper projects that, that raise those questions. And as, as somebody mentioned at the panel yesterday, um, it, it is important to give uh, the people, you know, first the experience and then second, uh, enough information and material to be able to go deeper. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely positive that not a lot of people, I mean, not out of all the audience that, for example, is at Signal or whoever audience is gonna go dig deeper, but the ones that actually are willing to and it triggers their interest, they should be able to and by, yeah, by having the information and by us being responsible for what we present. So it's not just pure entertainment. Yeah, f for me, it's, uh, it's also, it's also the different layers, but it's also how you can respect your audience and not do it for your peers necessarily, because because that's the trap too. It's like okay, let's not do entertainment, let's just do intellectual work, sure. But then you you do it for yourself, you do it for your peers, you do it to be in a museum uh, or to, to win a prize or, or, or something. I think that's that's the other trap. So the angle that I love in in the work we do is to sugarcoat it. It's like okay, let's let's make sure that we have something that 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 we feel strong about it in terms of of the cynicism or the message or, or how deep we want it to be but let's just make it super accessible so people um uh, are going to enjoy it uh, you know yeah sugar, like a sh sugar cutting you, you enjoy it right away but then you, there is a sour taste to it and for me that that's where i like to be that's that's very important to do it for, but not designed for the audience so they're just going to enjoy it but also not to do it just for my peers, so I look smart. It's uh, that, that's a very thin line. Mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> yes, and then perhaps there's also an um, an advantage in uh, experimentation. Uh, like you mentioned earlier, Max, the monkey is the most. Uh, you said that's one of the most uh, audience successful projects you have created, with perhaps the least uh, reflection. I don't know. You 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 had a very delicate way of uh, saying it. Yeah, I was saying that it was like the least with the the least amount of intention, or the least the most unintentional. Exactly. So maybe people do not always know what uh, what's the value of a space monkey unless you've actually met one, um, and 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 we can make fun of that. But at the same time, I think there's also a value in uh, in artistic creation in terms of trying things out, which big, big corporations don't do because there's an end goal of um, of selling things. But uh, but just uh, bringing our our conversation more towards the um, the next frontier of uh, the digital imagery in uh, urban space. What do you think when you look across your own practices, uh, in, uh, cases of uh, practices you are inspired by, when you look at what artists are doing today and the different um, tools available, technologies, uh, uh, softwares allowing for new things, what are the practices we should further? make more of or strengthen, ask for more budget for when we are in the practical situation of setting it up or getting allowances for, what, what tactics, what materialities, what should we further more when we participate in this uh, smartification of the city from an artistic side? But the technological part is, you know, if we could have cheaper projector or cheaper sensors, you know, it's always uh, something that is a bottleneck when you want to do, you have a very good idea that would uh, that would uh, be very interesting, but your the, the cost of the hardware is very, uh, very high. So it's maybe something that it would be interesting to, I don't know, to find a solution about that. I'm kind of, kind of laughing to myself a bit because 
we it's funny we face in prague i mean it's you know it's a beautiful city but we face such sim simple problems actually how to get art in public space because we have this institution that is protecting the public space so hard that actually we have to break the law to Actually, we're, I'm breaking the law every year that I do single festival to get in. So we have this like, I don't know, it's not really, I don't want to be saying third world problems, but but uh, it actually is different problems that we, it's not how, what is the frontier, but uh, how do we do it like the next year, really? And we've tried, and like my goal for a few years has been to leave one piece in the public space which is totally normal here in Montreal. You have it all over the place, right? To live one piece after a signal, so it's not so ephemeral. You invest like so much time and energy to, and then to artist energy to set something up, and then just like, poof, you know, gone. So, and and this has been uh, uh, actually, I'm not sure that I'm gonna be able ever to make it, like to leave one piece in the public space. Be well, it's not, it's not, it's not expensive. It's just. Uh, well, it's a bureaucratic thing, but if somebody wants to have a drink with me, I can complain for, you know, longer. <laughs> uh, but really, I mean, in, for me, it's, it's, I was just laughing because I really love to, you know, think about what's going to be next and further. But currently, it's like what's, how we're going to do, at least, you know, get one piece there and then combat the bureaucratic system. You know, Kafka comes from Czech Republic, so it all makes sense, right? <laughs> More perspectives than that. Yeah, we have similar challenges in New York when it comes to these restrictions. Um, they're ever increasing, it seems. Uh, you know, and a, a lot of times I think this is to combat, um, you know, unpermitted uh, again at the bad word advertising. But um, it ends up kind of uh, throwing in the face of artists. Uh, there's cases of uh, art exhibitions that have uh, had to be shut down because they violated these rules that were set up to protect the city from advertising. Uh, and this is not advertising, this is art, this is an art festival. Um, uh, so, yeah, I think the next frontier, uh, in addition to um, having access to more uh, affordable projection techniques or digital media to, uh, surfaces, uh, and also we also need to look at um, the laws of uh, you know public exhibition and and how that can become facilitated instead of uh, resisted, um, and there's not much uh, language for de delineating between different kinds of presentations. So maybe in addition to finding new w ways of creating, we also need to think of new ways of talking about it. And do you think art can cr um, cr uh, change? the rules of public space? Like, do you have experience with actually uh, setting up an art, artistic or creative project that eventually changed the closing hours of a park or that somehow actually created change? Maybe... Uh, well, we, yeah. we have in Montreal. I mean, we're, we're very lucky in Montreal to have a... You know, it, it's it's really moving forward with people like Cartier des Spectacles and, and, and so on. Like, like, I think it's truly happening in Montreal. Like. Let's just, um, you mentioned something, Martin, about the duration. Like, you like to, uh, you like to at least leave one art piece up there that can stay longer. Um, so, let's say that it would be possible when we create these projects to let them last for longer. Creating more of as uh, an audience relationship, perhaps with the same people over time, uh, in a concrete place like you can do here in Montreal with the Cartier du Spectacle. How? What would you like to achieve? Like, do you have any uh, goals? It might be any unrealized projects in your head of things that you would actually really like to come out of an installation in a place if you could if you could work with it like that. It's a question for me. Um, yeah, well, uh, it's it's quite plain simple. I just want to. I have this specific artist who's gonna, sorry, he's gonna die soon, you know. So, and he he's been creating uh, like uh, he's a Czech artist, and he's like in his late eighties, and um, we have uh, he has created many projects in in 
previous times for the public space, but this one is new and it wanted to present it at Signal. So this is uh, kind of like, uh, we want to change the perception of one specific uh, square, or you know the, the, the atmosphere of one specific square, which currently is not that, uh, I don't know, public public don't go there that much. So our aim is to kind of attract people and then because it's site specific and it's very convenient for the art piece that is in the works, uh, that, that's kind of like my goal and dream and possibly be able to leave it there and figure out who's gonna be the owner, etc. all the practicalities around it. So, but uh, as you asked, uh, if we think that, that art can change, I think it has been changing. Um, digital art could be changing when you figure out, you know, the, the, the costs and, and uh, I mean, in, uh, we've been d dealing with the ownership, who's gonna clean it, who's gonna maintain it, all, all that stuff. Uh, but once that there is something like that, I think it's, it would be beautiful and it, you're lucky to have it here uh, in Montreal. Well, I think if you want it to stay, it has to be gimmick-free also, which is very hard in digital art. So mm. if we can find something that's going to stay there for 25 years and still be relevant, then I mean it's really good work. <laughs> if any questions are coming along the way, just um, wave very big. Yes, that's actually you. Okay. Is there a microphone we can use? Oh, I'm sorry. <coughs> sorry. Um, okay. I'm just going to repeat what I said. I'm originally from Moscow, but live in New York for the last 12 years, and you guys together making a lot of sense to me. So <laughs> with strict rules, at the same time, New York um, kind of ambiguous rules as well. My question is, have you ever been arrested in New York <laughs> by doing your art? <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, the uh, The... Closest we've ever come to even any sort of trouble was uh, a very kind police officer came over and told us that the building owner of the building we were projecting on had uh, had requested that we turn off the projector, and so we did. Um, l you know, luckily we didn't get any in, in, in any trouble for that activation. Um, there is sort of a legal gray zone, and I don't think that a lot of the um, uh, I don't think there is a much much of a system for accountability set up. Um, so unless you are already, unless you're uh, applying for permits and coming up against the, you know, the mayor's office and all the various departments that are going to try to restrict these projects, um, if you actually just go and do it, um, there's not really anyone whose job it is to stop you. Um, and I think that the, the police officers have better things to deal with. Um, so, so far, uh, we uh, haven't gotten into any trouble for that. So now we are touching upon the topic of um, ethics, uh, which are sometimes there to be preserved or to be um, uh, furthered, and other times we, we have to find our ways and make our own ethical um, rules for putting up the art. Um, but if we think of ethics in terms of a more... Uh, uh, in a more sustainable realm, what do you think is, um, and maybe uh, maybe Jean Francois, maybe I could uh, ask you this. Um, and of course, a moment factory makes some of the loudest uh, digital imagery. So therefore, I ask you, yep. what do you think are some of the most important ethical principles that? Uh, creators have to work along when you have the the tools the power the finances to set up and to really push the next frontier of digital imagery it's a very good one um, you know it's it depends of uh, anyone everyone has a different opinion about you know selling products and you know ad agencies they want more and more to work with us because they they know that people engage wants to to be immersed and what but we don't do that much uh, brand activation but it's something that we do and we we like we try to find a way of making it uh, nice and making people to find something different and just wanting to be want to be to want to buy a product but uh, we do a lot of uh, concerts we do different stuff so 
uh, for me, the edict, it depends of, uh, I don't know, I don't have uh, one answer to that fits all, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if you can help me, guys. <laughs> what about you, Thibault? <laughs> what are the most important ethical principles you work around? Don't steal. <laughs> no, I, I don't mean, kill. Re really, that, I mean, uh, uh, as... as, uh, as um, you know, as a, as a festival, you have uh, dreams, right? You want to get artists that you really like, and then you find out they're super expensive, you can afford. So it kind of pops to your mind, hey, how about we do this? You know, I'm joking. Well, kind of it does, but uh, but uh, uh, I mean that copying. Uh, I mean, we we run this organization, International Life Festival organization, where we group together and we put a ethical list. And and one of the points actually is is respect the authors. Basically, I mean, to the full extent of the meaning. So that's that's. I mean, it, the the list has more rules, but I think actually respecting the authorship and the, the the intellectual property is one of the most valuable things uh, that we have to abide by. So what you mention here is ethic towards artists. What if we think about ethics towards citizens? Who are who are watching it? What is the responsibility when you come from um, from the creative side in terms of affecting discourse of how digital imagery will be produced also in the future? Because of course, advertisement looks to the art for inspiration. It usually goes, I think, that way. So if the art is inspiring what advertisement will do, what smart city imperatives will actually do, or at least how they will disseminate, communicate to citizens about new, efficient uh, inventions. What is then, it, when it trickles back, what is then the ethical responsibility of the artist to sit out there with uh, the audience in mind? Well, I think the, uh, in its, instead of looking at this through the lens of making rules or restrictions for oneself to follow a set of ethics. I think I'd rather look at it to, in a sense of we have an ethical obligation to make the art and to be involved because, let's face it, we're going to be taken over by robots and uh, everything is going to be a surface with media on it eventually. So. As artists, we have the ethical obligation to become involved and to make this transition an aesthetically pleasing one. Good point. Uh, and don't make it cheesy. Yeah? Yeah, I think that's it. No cheese. No cheese. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I had a question uh, yes. uh, Jean-Francois, but anyone can enter uh, or answer. Um, particularly because you were talking about working with a new building in Paris that you're creating content for. So I'm uh, wondering the relationship when we're talking about urban space and these interventions. A lot of time we're talking about existing spaces that have been around for some time, but thinking about new developments, new master plans, new buildings, do you think that relationship between artists and architects and urban planners that these are going to become part of new developments, kind of like how LEED certification, it's a no-brainer now for new developments, that there'll be some kind of artistic um, facade uh, kind of certification yeah, or something. Yeah, we're yeah, it's interesting. Interesting question. Actually, we I cannot name any city, but right now we have been approached for from different cities in the U.S. that wants to uh, build a new area in their city, a new neighborhood, and they want us to help them see how we can add the uh, interactivity and immersiveness and that kind. So yes, the if your question is in the new uh, development of city development plans, all the cities I think think that way now that they want to reinvent themselves and make sure that people uh, are connected when they go outside to the gym and to the shopping mall and stuff like that. So yeah. And also entertained. Entertained, yeah, the, yeah. It starts with shopping malls usually, you know, yeah. like, like you have the shopping mall and they're building that new shopping mall and they want to make sure that there is yeah, the show, the connectivity and, and blah, blah, blah. And then hopefully it's going to go to the city and then we're all going to yeah. be living in Disneyland. But shopping malls, are in, indeed, they are, you know, looking for new ways of attracting people because everybody buys online on Amazon now. So they want, they, find, they try to find new ways of making people come to their shop. 
I just want to come back to the ethics, something that just crossed my mind. Uh, you know, we were talking about overlapping between the, you know, our, our commercial companies actually getting into art space because it's kind of attractive. So I, I think, I mean, from for me, ethically, is really important to set the straight line or clear line between what is art and what is advertisement because it kind of, it's naturally blurring and blending. Yeah. But uh, sometimes, I mean, I, I, I would stick to that kind of like really quickly have a separate line. Separate line, or thinking that art could actually um, be used more in a sense of uh, rematerializing our world so that perhaps if we are thinking that the world, time will go, the world will progress. How does art take the best position in terms of being part of that evolution? So, because I'm asking this because it's something I'm um, sort of uh, struggling with in my head myself, uh, to what extent to say art has to be art, you cannot actually uh, blur the genres and you cannot receive money from this company if you make this kind of thing. Either that, that, that or, yeah. That I disagree though, I, I mean, the, the line has to be super straight, I, I do agree, but I feel like now brands, they are actually, some of them are actually thinking about becoming this kind of new mesen, I don't know how you say mesen in English, but but actually just like sponsor artists without any rules, you know, that it does exist. Like they, I, I think the reigning room in New York, I think one of the, the founders were like Toyota or something, or Honda, I don't know, some kind of brand that has nothing to do with it, conceptually. And I think, that's amazing. If, if if the brands understand that they can just commission artists to do absolutely whatever they want, then that's great. But if they just want to put logos everywhere and, and a car inside of it, then it's not art anymore. But so the line can be has to be sharp, but the money can come from anywhere. Whatever whatever get the jobs done, you know. <laughs> but I'm sure that we're gonna. Some people will have always to make sure to push that line to make sure that. You cannot just leave it like this because it's going to blend too much. So people have to make sure that the line is, yeah, and it's going to change. The, the canvas are changing. Everything's changing. So, Do we have any more questions from the audience? Yes, in the back. How, um, how do you see these kind of works adding or reducing the visual and light pollution in general? Is the question for anyone in specifically? AR glasses, <laughs> so you see the light, nobody sees it. Yeah, I think that uh, you know reducing light pollution is something that these projects could potentially contribute to because by uh, bringing to bringing the uh, the concept of projection to the realm of artwork allows it to be focused on in an, in its aesthetic quality. So rather than an advertising realm, it's like, let's just slam them with this with these advertised messages. It's more about creating spaces that are supposed to be aesthetically pleasing. So if we're able to have more and more art surfaces, digital surfaces that are devoted to art, maybe we can have more control over them and be able to turn them off um, to enjoy the stars at a certain point in the night. I think most most of the art pieces that we're talking about are temporary, so I don't think they impact the you know the, the the overall quality of light pollution. And about three years ago, to compensate you know the the, the light intensity of Signal Festival, we have had actually managed to switch off half of the Prague city for about four hours, so we compensated the 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 light pollution. Um, uh, no, actually, something went off, exploded. The <laughs> but actually, but the, at midnight, at midnight of the end of the festival, it was like a dream come true, not really, but at midnight, half of the city turned off. So it was, you know, three years in advance of compensation, maybe. <laughs> but perhaps on a critical self-reflective note, and um, also speaking uh, as a curator, uh, I do think that sometimes putting up powerful uh, artistic imagery in the urban space can help um, unfortunately help stimulate an excitement about visual imagery so and one that is approved of or one that is appreciated because it doesn't come with an advertisement brand uh, so in terms of the light pollution um, I do think that um, the artworks we work with are participating at least in that 
problem. Uh, that's why perhaps what we what what we could think about is um, is that a rule of. Uh, uh, that sense of ethics, you know, going back to that and think about what are the materials that we work with. Uh, do artists, for example, have a responsibility, like everyone else, to try to choose technologies um, that are uh, that are more sustainable? To think about how we create the art that that is part of an ecosystem with the city, and perhaps when we are already negotiating uh, to get place in the city, that that negotiation might be broadened, so could we shut down that light in that area during the art piece, so that the art is showing a good way of, uh, of using public space. That could be uh, something that, uh, that I think that we all have to take to heart, actually. So I am told now that our time is up. Um, I would like to leave you all with one question uh, in mind, which is what do we really want from digital imagery in the urban space uh, when we continue, go back to our practices or our readings, what we do? What is it that we want from it? Because that is not only something that um, is uh, should be defined by how it is demonstrated, whether in artistic or other creative practices, corporate practices, but it should really be a reflection that we have uh, before that. What is it that we want with these images? What is it that we think that they do to us? How do they do us good? How do they hurt us? And we should definitely not work more towards the end where it hurts us. Then we should adjust the way that we work around it. So what do we want from it? Thank you all for listening and thank you so much to the panel. Let's give them a hand. Applause